Um, uh, folks, if somebody could just indicate uh, in the text box that uh, you can hear me. Hmm. Fantastic. Bismillah. So we start. Thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, further to our, our conversation yesterday, there, there were a few questions that came up um, after the, uh, our discussion on the second station. Um, and um, th these were the questions. Uh, um, <clears throat> Aisha, uh, so there were two and they were kind of related. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll indicate both of the questions that First of all, she, she wanted to know, can a 40-year-old be stuck at stage two? Now, that's pretty extreme. I mean, remember, this is, this is such a primitive way of being that you don't yet have the wherewithal to properly start to work with language yet because your, your, your experience of, of, of subject, of self, is, um, is, very, uh, uh, is very sort of... Um, uh, and ill-defined. So you, you're not really experiencing yourself as a person yet. Uh, you, you're exploring your own boundaries. And so the fundamental binary opposite that sits underneath language, which is the ability to distinguish between the subject and the object, the self and other, that's not properly operating yet. So this is a very primitive way of being. Um, if a 40-year-old is stuck, yeah, this person is seriously brain damaged. I mean, or is seriously... Uh, uh, compromised uh, physically. Um, however, um, we can, so the second question that I, um, Aisha asked is, can we delay our progress? And Aisha, yes, I do think we can. Um, particularly the latter stages. So there's, a, there's, there's pretty much the force of the inevitable in the early stages of growth. And particularly because society is actually very good at socializing us, and turning us into citizens. So um, generally, there's, um, we can't, we, we, we don't delay too much in the earlier stages of our development because um, uh, we, th there's, in a sense, our own volition isn't that much at issue. But in the latter stages of our development, um, absolutely, we can get stuck. And I, I, I think that, in fact, very, very many people don't get beyond really exploring the inward, which is really what the latter stage of the de development of attention is all about. So in a sense, the short answer is yes, we can delay our growth and we can delay our growth particularly um, in the latter stages of our growth. And then, then Leila wanted to know, will attention be possible by practi while practicing intention? Now, uh, uh, Leila, this... So, this, um, I mean, I can only repeat what I said yesterday, and that is that, in a sense, the distinction between intention and attention is really, it's not in the phenomenon being looked at, but it's in the, the, it's the words whereby one's doing the looking. So, intention and attention refer to the same thing. It's by different name, and by calling that thing that we're looking at different names, we understand different things about it. So it's a little bit like when you're looking at light, light is light, but when you, you, you can describe light as a particle, or you can describe light as a wave, and when you describe light as a, as a, as a wave, um, there's certain things that are allowed by that understanding and certain things that are disallowed. Similarly, if you describe it as a particle. So that's the usefulness of just looking at what sits in the inside of a human being as attention or intention. So they're not separate phenomena. They're deeply related phenomena. They're actually the same thing. It's different compasses or different maps uh, looking at the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so, folks, we, um, we get on with the job. And then we'll handle any questions uh, from this. So I won't go through the whole model. Uh, I, I, cause I, I should imagine that, uh, I'll just remind you, um, about the basics, uh, that we come covered so far. 
we said um, any station is pinned, has, has an apex to it. In other words, it's the key character of it. Um, so the, the earliest station, uh, the station of the infant, we call the station of the insignificant. We said any station is also pinned between two binary opposites. Um, the one binary opposite operates as the conservative drum. The one end of that spectrum operates as the conservative drum and the other one operates as the progressive drum. And as we mature through the station of attention, we pray the progressive drum more and more kind of insistently or more loudly. So we said the station of the infant, the station of the insignificant, you replay the drum of the outward to the point where that station flips to the station of form, which is the station of the crawler. You remember I spoke about my granddaughter, Sophia, and the tussle that she had with her mother, trying to move away from the gatheredness of mother's knee to separating. And that, that tussle, that pull, one can describe as almost like the infant or the, the crawler pulling an elastic band further and further and further. So as they play this, uh, this, this progressive drum of separation louder and louder, they're, 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 it's almost like they're trying to snap the umbilical cord between them or the invisible umbilical cord between themselves and the mother. This period to remind us is, is the period of the crawler is all about the crawler gaining form. So it's the, about the crawler beginning to realize it's about attention pushing into the world, pushing through the window of perception and the, 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 the person actually beginning to understand that they also have a form. So this is another way of describing this way of being is that it's, 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 it's the person realizing that they're a person among people, that they have a shape and the shape is similar to other people's shapes, that, this, that, that they, they too have a form. This pulling this, um, this elastic band of separation can be pulled to the point of absolute extremity at which point it snaps and you, are then, you then end up at a third station of, of attention. We call that station of attention the station of the outward. This is, in a sense, middle childhood. So where the crawler was basically exploring their own outwardness, their own form, in middle childhood, you're exploring the world. You're exploring the great out there. So you may remember... As a child, you would have been very fascinated with, uh, with gardens and insects. I remember as, as, as a child, we used to, um, you know, I'd, uh, I'd wake up at six o'clock in the morning and, and uh, particularly if it wasn't a school day, I'd be out of the house like a flash and I'd be climbing trees and, you know, swimming rivers and doing all sorts of adventurous stuff out there, learning about the world. So there's a great curiosity about the world out there at this stage in one's life. And this is one of the reasons why one often experiences um, young children to have almost like a perverse cruelty, um, like the pulling off flies, wings, and dissecting frogs and things like that. This is not because the child is cruel. The child really, it really is exploring the world. The child's trying to understand how things are being put together. So, so attention is completely dedicated to curiosity about the world out there, the outward out there. As we indicated, any station is pinned between two binary opposites. The, in this case, the infant, the, 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 the child and middle childhood is pinned between the station of, of but is pinned between the insignificant and the significant. Now, this is, and also the insignificant is the is what is predominates at the beginning of the station, and the significant is what predominates at the end of the station. Now, this is significance and insignificance in two senses. First of all, it is the 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 the, the significance of the self, and also the capacity to designate what is significant. So let's look at the latter piece first, the capacity to designate what's significant. Um, if you've had, I mean, if you've ever watched soccer being played, then it might be 
quite I mean, at club level, but played by six-year-olds. It is the most intriguing thing to watch because if there's one thing they cannot play as a position, you have this knot of kids who wrap around the ball and kind of push it around the field, fighting with each other the whole time. Um, uh, you know, and it's, it's, in other words, the, at that stage, you can't distinguish between um, roles, between what is the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do, between what's significant or insignificant. So little Ahmad has got the ball, everybody's screaming their heads off, he's kicking the ball and he's having such, and everybody's, you, all these little feet are flailing and finally he gets to kick the ball into a goal and it's an own goal. Uh, so, so actually what's more, much more important in this stage is not getting it right, but just participating, being part of, and not really being able to designate what's the right thing to do, what's the significant thing to do um, in this station. What happens as we mature is that, that this station, we become more and more capable of distinguishing what is significant, what is the right thing to give attention to. So the, the soccer of, um, of 12-year-olds or of 11-year-olds is a completely different prospect from soccer uh, of six-year-olds. In fact, when six-year-olds are on the field, the coaches should actually be on the field with the six-year-old. Otherwise, it turns into a melee. It turns into a bloodbath. But as they grow older, they, they, they lead, need less and less supervision. And each player, in a sense, can, can be trusted to play their role, to take on their position. In other words, can be trusted to, desert, to distinguish between what's the significant thing to do and what's not the significant thing to do on the field at the time. So as we get as we mature into this phase of our lives, we become more and more capable of designating significance, of uh, working out what is significant rather than what's insignificant. What's also important is that this ability to designate the distinction between the insignificant and the significant isn't just what's happening on the inside. It's also what's happening if you look at the person. So, the, the we, we're, with young children, um, uh, you know, post crawling, um, there's almost an acceptance that they're at the, the bottom of the pecking order. But what happens as we mature, going towards our adolescence, so towards, you know, it becomes who you are in a pecking order becomes increasingly important. It's very important that you are seen to be the significant one. So, so, um, uh, you know, where the six-year-old runs, he runs to participate. The 11-year-old the, the runs to win. The 11-year-old runs to become, be, be, be um, more significant than others. It becomes an increasingly competitive way of being with the world. It's really very difficult to get six-year-olds to compete properly. Mm. But it's not difficult at all to get pre-adolescents to compete properly because that's, that's, that's all. And in fact, it's this drive to competition, this desire to become more significant than others is actually the thing that pulls us completely out of ourselves to stand out because that's what you're trying to do when you're trying to be significant. You're trying to stand out. So I'd like you to consider another way of exploring the, uh, the modalities of attention is that there's the distinction between standing in, which is consistent with receptive attention that we spoke about before, and standing out, which is consistent with predatory attention. Standing out means not being the one who stands back and allows the world to arrive. In other words, uh, the try, the, uh, allowing the scene to be seen. Uh, standing out is about wanting to be seen. And as we grow through the latter end of childhood, we are increasingly insistent of wanting to be seen. We want to stand out. We want to be the one who is admired. We want to be the significant one. We want to separate, which is basically why when you play that drum, that progressive drum of significance loudly enough in later childhood, you end up with um, full-blown adolescence, which is the most alienated state we have, which is called separation. Um, more about that tomorrow, folks. So um, uh, let's have a look. Are there any questions? Does that mean that the development in earlier stages is driven by instinctive forces 
whereas in later stages, we have to be delivered. Um, uh, Ghulam Kafil Saab, that's exactly what I think is the case. In the earlier stages, there's more, there's more of an inexorable uh, kind of uh, instinctive process that's at work, but the, the your volition, your deliberate intent to participate in the matter becomes more and more significant the further along this process you become. Um, so, so up until the stage we've just, we've just ended up on, the station of separation, which is the station of the adolescent, there's almost like an inevitability, but even from separation to significance, there's, we'll see tomorrow, there's a, 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 some reason needs to enter the picture here. So, I think the way in which Allah has created attention and the way in which attention unfolds means that whatever the context that we're in, um, we will seek to be significant as we go through our later childhood. But um, uh, that, that is, is then kind of, that, that society in a sense works with that impulse. Now, I know this is not a satisfying answer, Shabnam, but so, so what you're operating is the bifurcation between this idea of nature and nurture. This idea that, you know, are we social beings or are we natural beings? Are we instinct driven or are we programmed by society? And I, I'm beginning to wonder whether that, that distinction is a useful distinction. I actually don't actually, I don't think it is because the human condition is so deeply interwoven with being social, a social being, you know, and there's a number of things that just without even looking at the divine origin of this, there's a number of things we can put forward to, uh, to, to make the point. I'd like to suggest a few. The one is that human gestation is really long and human infants are, are, are very vulnerable for very long which means that we cannot live as a species without cooperating. So cooperation, which is really the social instinct, is the thing that is part of our natural drive. It's with, there wouldn't be a human being if we didn't cooperate. So you can't, it's cooperation, the drive to cooperate, the drive to be a, a person among people, the drive to be a social being is part of our natural order. It's not an unnatural thing. It's not contradistinct to our instinct. So I think to use the bifurcation of nature and nurture when we're talking about how we mature as people is not actually particularly useful. From the pace of your lectures, it seems that the journey from significance to from significance to in, I, I'm assuming you mean from insignificance is quite speedy. Well, actually, not necessarily, um, Ali Sahab, because uh, the, this this journey is over the period of middle childhood. So, from when the child stops crawling, so so I would. The hazard to say, well, so think about it. When would you first uh, want to take your little daughter to dancing lessons or your, your, your son to karate lessons where they need to conform to something that other people are doing? Most kids, we talk probably talking about three, three and a half. So that's kind of the beginning of the stage. And um, three and a half, four, possibly, Aisha. And the significant, and, and so, and, and the end of the station when we're really about is, is I would say, 12, end of 12, 13 years. That's when we kind of we go to this. So, so the move from insignificant to significant is an epoch, actually. It starts from, uh, it goes through the whole of middle childhood. It goes from about four years to 12 years. And I, I think also we, we, you know, we don't, we don't, we, 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 uh, uh, the actual length of time isn't necessarily predictable with people. I mean, this goes back to what Aisha was saying before.
Well, I'm Kafil Saab. I'm not entirely sure that I understand what you're saying, so I'm going to read it aloud. Um, other, other than let me just get back there. Other than time-based template to identify the development, is there another template other than the time-based? Um, so, so fundamentally, this this template actually isn't time-based because it, it it has a very rough um, uh, correspondence with various areas or epochs of people's lives. Um, uh, but we, we, the, you can't say clinically, this child is now hit its fourth birthday. It's definitely in this stage. This, this person is, has just finished, they've hit their 13th birthday. They are definitely in the next stage. Just like, I mean, it's not even physiologically true. People mature at different rates physiologically. Uh, you know, not every girl goes because goes into puberty at the same time. I mean, not every not every girl, girl gets her menses at the same time. Just just like in the same way, not every boy's voice drops at the same time. Uh, there's a range to this. Uh, fear of losing mother to chronic illness. She's been diagnosed when I was twenty. It made me feel vulnerable and dependent on her, as I did when I was five. 13 years on, I feel I'm still trying to grow out of that state of mind. A five-year-old who feels insecure and vulnerable about their mummy. How does one make sense of this and navigate this? Wow. Hmm. So, so, so that, that kind of question I would suggest is like, uh, eight stations uh, 503, as opposed to eight stations 101 kind of question. And, and here's my intuitive kind of take on that. First of all, what becomes clear, what the eight stations becomes clear is that the whole thing is not, we're not static. There's an oscillation that goes on, and that oscillation is an oscillation that drives our movement through the process. And it could be that there might be something that, that, that uh, 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 is, is almost like a remnant. It's like a hangover from a previous uh, state of being. But that's not your predominant state of being, uh, Miriam. So, uh, so I'll give you an example. Just because you, are, you still have this insecurity about the love of your parent, your loss of your, your mother, and that anxiety still still sits there, the, almost like a like a hangover or a shadow. Does that mean to say you didn't you weren't at all competitive as an adolescent? Does that mean to say that when we go look at the latter stages, for instance, that you um, were a completely unable parent yourself? And I doubt that that's the case. So, so in a sense, these there might be traumas that we have in the past that kind of leave a shadow of something unresolved. But that's not the, your predominant status, I think. Um, what is the name we give to this stage? The, the name we give to the stage is the stage of the outward. The one that we just described. This stage three is the stage of the outward. As all of this development and maturation is most happening on auto, is there any coding of values or practices or references parents can try to inculcate through the middle childhood phase? Well, yes. Clearly, what's happening is that the child is learning to distinguish between what's insignificant and what's significant. So, this is where the, you know, dare I say, even if it's clumsy, the moral kind of um, coding of the child becomes very important. You know, so for instance, when you're playing the game, you're not just playing to win, you're playing with good sportsmanship and things like that. So, you help the child to identify, to construct their sense of significance around things that are wholesome. Um, and in that sense, this is not dissimilar from the question that, uh, 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 that we spoke about before, with, you know, is this nature, or is this nurture? Well, with a human being, these two things are kind of hand in glove. Uh, good societies work with the energy that nature provides, which is this, this, this exploration of attention into the outward to guide what the child makes significant and what the child deems as insignificant. 
We encourage kids, so Asif, um, we encourage kids to stand out in competition. It, that, well, um, uh, I think it's correct to encourage kids to stand out in competition because that's what gets them, delivers them as full-blown adolescents. So, so I don't think there's anything wrong with getting them to compete. What, what, there, there is something I'd like to add to this, though, and that is you can cultivate an experience in the person quite early on of not competing to beat others, but competing to beat themselves. In other words, to become best, better than, the, 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 than themselves. And I'd, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to refer to, uh, uh, in fact, I'll put it on the, on the WhatsApp group afterwards. Um, this whole issue of collaboration in sport rather than competition in sport, the Swedes get this right. I had a, uh, a, a, a basically produced a, a little video on um, on the, the the Swedish classic, which my wife uh, Anna is an administrator of, and um, it talks to this. So, so in a sense, what I'm suggesting is we can encourage kids not to engage sport to compete in the spirit of beating others, but to compete in the spirit of becoming better than themselves, and that's a more wholesome thing that will stand them in far better stead in later in the later kind of periods of their lives. Can oscillation occur through the maturation process? Where can, uh, um, so, so yes, so, so oscillation in fact does occur through the maturation process. Um, <clears throat> so so, so you're, we were speaking about these uh, tazir, this thing of the conservative and the progressive drums. So in any station, let's say we're talking about the station of the outward, the child is playing both drums. But when they start off in the station, they play the drum of the, the conservative drum of the significant really loudly and, the, and the, the, of the insignificant rather, really loudly. And the significant is played far more gently. As they progress through the station, the, the, that changes incrementally. There's a louder and louder beating of the drum of significance and a softer and softer beating of the drum of insignificant until there's a fundamental imbalance in the state. And that then ratchets into the next station of attention. So, um, uh, so j just to remind us, we were speaking, uh, Ali Lashari asked yesterday, this, you know, is this, uh, is this like a flip, flip or is it incremental? It was basically the implication of his question. Is that, well, actually it's both because it's like the boiled frog. You know, at some point the frog is still alive, but it's quietly getting boiled. And at some point, it is no longer a living frog. It's a dead frog. It is now a boiled frog. It's arrived at the next state of being. So it's like that. We kind of, we oscillate, we go through the state, and then eventually we flip, we're consolidated into a new state of being. Uh, right. And, and in fact, uh, Fahzab, this, this actually refers to uh, the... Um, uh, quite a number of the questions that came up. So, uh, on the path in Tasawwuf, we distinguish between hal and maqam. And we translate those two terms as the distinction between station, state rather, and station. The relationship between hal and maqam, uh, or state and station, is the relationship between weather and climate. So, um, if you came to visit me now, you would probably think uh, South Africa, and, and, and this particular datum point, uh, where it's kind of, it's a nice green country, and because we're just at the end of our rainy season, and it's all very beautiful. That's, and the weather today is, is splendid. I mean, it's, 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 it's very temperate, um, uh, that does not give you a, an assessment of the, the climate of Johannesburg. The climate of Johannesburg is an average across a number of datum points of weather. So, so weather is what you have on the day. Climate is what you have over a period of time. And climate is, if you like, an abstraction that's informed by a number of datum points. So it is true with any station. Any station is an abstraction of a number of datum points. Um, uh, the number of datum points you can call state. 
and and so 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 let's take for instance the station of the outward so that's kind of like uh, the so the general climate of the of a person in this station of is that the attention is fundamentally concerned with exploring the world out there like the young child kind of swinging through the trees or climbing trees and stealing the neighbor's fruit that's exploring the world out there the sta that 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 climate is also informed by instances of weather that would be fundamentally be about tussling between the issue of insignificant and ins and significant and over a period of time that you get more instances of of kind of the pursuit of significance kind of coming to the fore than the insignificant until in fact the climate has fundamentally changed and you're in a new station so the relationship between state and station Hall and Makam is the relationship between climate and weather. Climate can vary and does vary. Weather is a description. I mean, well, uh, weather can vary. Climate is a description. It's an abstraction of a, of a number of datum points over time. Uh, Afia, I don't. Th so, so, so the further the stations are away from each other, the less we actually oscillate between stations. Um, so, for instance, somebody in, in separation doesn't start to kind of bang the, uh, the, 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 the kitchen pots to find out what their hand can do, you know. So you could still oscillate maybe a little bit between these two, but you will not oscillate more than two. No, I don't think that's possible because the, to, in order to be in that station, that needs a really significant reconfiguration of how your attention operates. How does the concept of fana impact on the issue? So Tazir, I'd like to keep the whole issue of fana because that is actually the latter stage of our, uh, of our, of our discussion. So um, that, that's looking at the latter end of this. So, I, so if, if you don't mind, we'll leave that until later. So folks, thank you very much. Again, I've had a, um, a great um, uh, fun at your expense. And um, uh, uh, I hope, uh, I beg your pardon, shouldn't have done that. Oh God, this is even worse. Uh, anyhow, there you go. Unless you're very fast, you wouldn't have met, got any of that, I'm sure. Thank you very much, folks. All the best. Uh, may Allah bless you all and keep you and um, make it all, make your path easy for you. And inshallah, we'll see each other here tomorrow uh, discussing the fourth state, station of attention the station of separation. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.